Good evening, everybody. It's absolutely brilliant you've made it. It's very stormy here in the UK, and it's fantastic we're reaching so many people across the world. Um, we do have electricity, but there's lots of people without it, so I'm feeling for them and just hope everyone's safe. And I'm not sure we'll have Wi-Fi for the whole presentation. Thank you, Jane. My usual question, can you see me and hear me? I know I've got a slight delay of about four or five seconds. Thank you, Michelle, that's great, and let's get into it. So I'm really excited to have had so much feedback about the other bite-sized canine anatomy um, muscles that we've been covering, and they all integrate with each other, and that's what's so exciting, and I'm incredibly excited to tell you all about latissimus dorsi and how it has a huge impact for canine therapists. So I'm just gonna bring this first slide up. There we go. So let's dive into those muscle facts. It's a bite-sized 25 minute chat. I will try and answer all the questions. I've seen a few popping in. If you've not used Crowdcast before, if you look along the bottom line, you'll see ask a question. Please put the question in there. We had a few that went in the chat and they roll up and we lose them. So I, I want to answer your questions So make sure they go along the navigation bar at the bottom. And you can also vote on them. So if you vote, it upvotes the questions and I will answer the one that's the most popular. Um, when, I'm ask, when I'm actually answering the question, if you can stop the upvoting, otherwise it goes off my screen. So when I deliver this, I'm delivering blind from my screen. I don't see what you see. Okay, so latissimus dorsi, how exciting to finally get to this fantastic muscle. It's huge, it's large, it's flat, it's almost triangular shape. Um, and it, we're going to find it here lying in this area here, which we refer to as the lateral dorsal aspect of the dog's trunk. So I've had a few people who contacted me and said they're not really following all the anatomical um, words. So I'll try and give um, a couple of words for it and not lose you there. So dorsal is this area here. I hope you can see my arrow moving around and ventral is the lower part down here. So I hope the time lag means you can see the arrow or the cross. Thank you, Sarah, that helps a lot. So it lies caudal to the brachium, which is the arm. So here's the brachium. It lies caudal to the brachium and the scapular muscles. There's your scapula in this diagram. And it lies on the dorsal lateral aspect of the dog's chest and it is huge it's really important to all natural balance motion in the dog it has an extensive proximal attachment which we're going to explore in the next few slides and it's got a really complex and interesting distal attachment um, the innovation let's start there first clinical tip coming up so i always try and put in some clinical tips from my perspective the innovation is the thoracodorsal nerve. Now, the thoracodorsal nerve mainly arises from the eighth cervical nerve. It also has branches from um, the first thoracic nerve and also the seventh cervical nerve. And it is the motor supply for latissimus dorsi. So this is the first thing to be really aware. There is no cutaneous innovation of lat dorsi. Oh, sorry, Jane, maybe um, we've got a sound problem there. So can you hear me? Can ev everybody else hear me or have I gone offline? Can you hear me speaking now about the thoracodorsal nerve? Thank you, Michelle, thank you. Okay, so the innovation nerve is a motor nerve. And this is really important because you are not going to use sensory awareness techniques on lap dorsi because it's not relevant to this muscle if you're wanting to activate it and to prime it ready for movement. So you've got to think as a motor supply only how we're going to do that and it has to be by action in it. So we're going to move on to the next slide. There we go. So let's hunt and look at this proximal attach attachment because it's quite complicated, but once we kind of talk about it, it will be really clear. So when you see charts and pictures, you will very often see this section here. And this is part of the muscle. This is its attachment. This is the deep fascia. 
Now, if you see the word thoracolumbar fascia, in old anatomical texts, this is known as the lumbodorsal fascia. They're the same thing. It's just it's an older name for the same structure. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how muscles attach to help you really understand what an aponeurosis is. So uh, most skeletal muscles, they're attached by connective tissue, and it's to a bone or sometimes to cartilage. And this can be in a form of a cord-like tendon, which you're all very aware of, but it can also be like a flat sheet, which we know as an aponeurosis. Some muscles actually attach directly to the bone's periosteum as well, and they're called flesh fleshy attachments. So here, lat dorsi, latissimus dorsi, is attached through a wide tendinous leaf from the deep thoracolumbar fascia. And through the thoracolumbar fascia, it arises from all the lumbar vertebrae and the last several thoracic vertebrae. So it has a huge origin. Now, if you look at any other really major muscle, you will not find something which, with such an enormous attachment. Now, origin and insertion are a bit arbitrary when it concerns such a big muscle like this. So you usually have the word origin for an insertion for the attachments of muscles that are within a limb. So here we've got an amazing attachment and when you understand a bit more about the fascia, a really unusual attachment. So origin and insertion are arbitrary. Also, the origin tends to be the most fixed part and is more proximal, more nearest to the axial skeleton. And the insertion tends to be the part of the, of the muscle that moves more. Again, not so with latissimus dorsi. We've got a very dynamic structure um, to, to look at. I'm just going to the next slide. There we go. Okay, we seem to just have a tech issue here. I'm just going to, there we go. Hang in there with me. So here we go, this huge deep fascia. And this is the deep, so we've got deep fascia and we have got superficial fascia. And you know that some places it's very intimate and you can't separate them. Other places, it's really loose. So you know with a dog along its neck, you can lift up that tissue there, the skin, and it comes away. So that's where it's very loose, whereas other places, it can be very intimate. So the deep fascia is thick. The deep fascia is thick. It's shiny. It's dense. It's a tendinous membrane. And it begins here, if you have a look along the spinous processes here, hopefully you can see my arrow on the picture. It, beling, it starts from the ends, the tips of the spinous processes on the supraspinous ligament. And this deep fascia then is attached here to the ilium. And it offers a superficial leaf to latissimus dorsi. So the deep fascia has two leaves. It has a superficial part and a deep part. And the superficial part of the deep fascia offers for a tendinous leaf for latissimus dorsi to arise off it. So it has the most enormous dynamic attachment here. The muscle fibers, they converge. On this picture here, you can see. And this is the triangular shape of the muscle. And this is the apical end here of the muscle here. So we've tried to do this colored, uh, this little bit here is trapezius. It's just the thoracic part of trapezius. So we've tried to do, so the green plasticine represents the muscle fibers and this whitish stuff here, all along here and underneath it represents the deep fascia. So what happens is the muscle fibers converge they come down here to that apical end and they lay beneath deep to or medial to, this is the thoracic part of trapezius. We haven't put the cervical part of trapezius in, that would be another triangular shape. We've just used this thoracic part for a reason, just to focus on latissimus dorsi. And this yellow muscle here, the yellow muscle here, this is deltoid. And we've got two parts to deltoid. 
that's the scapular head here, and then coming off the acromion here is the acromion fusiform, and they attach to the deltoid tuberosity, which is a, a bump on the humerus, on the lateral cranial aspect. And that's important because it's going to orientate you to the bony landmark that latissimus dorsi is attached to, but we can't palpate because it's deep, it's medial. And the blue plasticine here represents the long head here and the lateral head of triceps. So we're trying to give you the layers. So essentially, the superficial fascia, the superficial fascia of the external superficial fascia of the trunk of the dog, lays immediately on top of trapezius and latissimus dorsi. So if you peel back the skin and the superficial fascia, this is what you're going to be palpating. So we've got some more diagrams here because, <laughs> because there's a really great little biomechanical design. So the cranial border of latissimus dorsi lies over the caudal angle of the scapula. And why is this really important? Because we're going to think about where the fall in movement really happens in the dog. So the scapula has a very important joint with the thorax, and that's called the scapular thoracic joint. I'm just going to write something in the chat. It's a synsarcotic joint. This is really unusual because there's no bony union. So the, the scapula lays within an amazing thoracic sling of muscle. The trapezius is one of those muscles. And its movement for the forelimb is all about the rotation and glide of the scapula on the thorax wall. So I'd like you to put your elbow on the table. So if you put your elbow on the table with your hand up in front of you, and I want you to think of an a pendulum in a grandfather clock. So we've got the round pendulum is represented by your hand because we're going to invert it. And your arm going down to the table is like a stick. And then I just want you to move your hand slowly from side to side. So your elbow represents the paw of the dog on the ground and the movement, the main area of movement, because very little movement happens at the shoulder, elbow and carpus, is happening up at that scapula thoracic joint and it is gliding and rotating. So these, these muscles that surround this thoracic sling are a design feature, whereas the if you have a look at the hind limbs or your pelvic limbs here in this picture here, they're more zigzag shaped and they are attached to the spine through a really strong coupling. And that's the sacroiliac joint. And so the dog is a rear engine animal. The engine, the power which is generated from the muscles comes from the gluteals and the hamstrings. They're the main retractor muscles of the hind limb, of the pelvic limb. Whereas the forelimb, Yes, it's designed to support the dog against gravity, just like the hind limbs are. And yes, it's designed to accelerate the dog in the forward direction, just like the hind limbs are. But it's also got this very important role as braking and shock absorbing, which is served by this thoracic sling. So as the dog jumps and pushes off with its pelvic limbs, as it lands and puts its thoracic limbs to the ground, its paws connect to the ground, we have a vibration of the thorax within the forelimbs to dissipate the force. So I'm hoping that's really exciting you to think about this thoracic sling of muscle, which is going to really be such an important area for us to look at in future canine anatomy bite-sized kind of chunks. But at, for the moment, we're just looking at trapezius and I'm only looking at the thoracic part. There's a cervical part as well. So if we lift that up, Deep to that, we've got latissimus dorsi, and it covers the caudal angle of the scapula to optimize that rotation and glide of the scapula across the, the wall of the dog, the, the thorax of the dog, and facilitates a really efficient biomechanical model. So the dog is not designed to power from the front. Let's get to the next slide. My T is always my challenge. Okay, so let's look at these distal attachments. So the, the proximal attachments are extensive. They're exciting because they involve fascia, 
Fascia's strong, elastic, mobile. We've got movable ends at both these parts and it's across the caudal core of the dog. Let's look at the distal attachment. So the triangular shape of latissimus dorsi comes to this apical shape here. And the reason I've got that there is because this on the lateral side, hopefully you can see that there, is where deltoid attaches. Opposite that, on the medial side, which we cannot palpate because of all the muscles that are covering that area, is the teres major tuberosity. And these are bumps on the bones which are offer attachment. So you often people say latissimus dorsi has a conjoined tendon with teres major, which is another muscle, and attaches to the teres major tuberosity. That is only part of the story. And the really exciting thing now is uh, for manual therapists and physiotherapists using soft tissue work, um, massage therapies, myofascial releases, the impact that this has due to this integrated anatomy. So what we've got is that the distal attachment, it goes medial to the muscles of the brachium of the arm. It goes medial to the shoulder muscles and it actually ends on an aponeurosis, a sheet-like structure. And this sheet-like structure is medial to triceps brachii. If you haven't seen the triceps brachii bite-sized canine anatomy, you can pick that up on um, our YouTube channel, Canine HS, or on our website in the resources. It's there on replay. So it lays on the aponeurosis, which covers triceps. So this is getting really exciting because it's gonna have a par attachment with teres major, which is a muscle that's a shoulder flexor and it lays deep. Um, and it's gonna have this conjoined tendon that continues to the teres major tuberosity, but it's also going to have a really important partial attachment because it joins the deep pectoral muscle. And that is part of that thoracic swing. And it's going to actually terminate on the medial fascia of the brachium of the arm with the pectoral muscle. And there's a bit more to this story we're going to cover in the next couple of slides because that's not the end of it. So it's got partial attachments and literally at the ventral border here of latissimus dorsi, it throws out muscle fibers that are integrated with the deep pectoral muscle. And these fibers go over biceps brachii integrated with deep pectoral and then they arise into the medial fascia and also attach to the greater tuberosity on the medial aspect coming round. What this means is latissimus dorsi and the deep pectorals make a muscular axillar archway. Now if you've got a muscular axillar arch in the dog like you have in the cat, this is an optimum place. When you're doing your myofascial releases and you're thinking on superficial pecs and deep pecs, you're impacting latissimus, latissimus dorsi, you're impacting triceps, and you're impacting that fascia as well. So I get so excited, I can't help it, about anatomy, because it tells you the story, it gives you so much information. So just coming on to this slide, this is where the green plasticine is latissimus dorsi, the orange plasticine laying superficial to latissimus dorsi, is trapezius, just the thoracic part of trapezius. There's another part we haven't shown. The yellow, this is the scapula head of deltoid, which is a shoulder flexor. And this is an acromial head. So it's got two heads that fixes to the deltoid tuberosity on the lateral aspect of the humerus, of, of the arm. And let us in a store see it goes medial to the teres major tuberosity with the teres major muscle in a conjoined tendon fused together. But it also throws out some muscle fibers on its ventral border, integrates with the deep pectoral and arises with that into the medial fascia. Astonishing. So we know we're going to have a multiple impact to optimize this sector, which is so important for breaking and and shock absorbing, particularly in your athletic and agility dogs. So here, this is on a, um, a lovely border terrier. And what I've done is parted the hair just carefully, just to show you the ventral border of latissimus dorsi. So another top clinical tip, if you want to palpate latissimus dorsi working with the dog, use a flat hand, start in the dorsal section, and come downwards and you will drop off the ventral border like a cliff. You'll feel it, it's very subtle 
and you can literally work your way along the dog, but you need to use therapeutic handling so the dog can maintain its balanced posture while you palpate to give you really accurate information. So just talking about therapeutic touch, if you haven't seen the therapeutic touch crowdcast, again, it's on our YouTube, K9HS, or it's also on our resources in a learning track, which is really useful um, to review things. So it's a two-way communication. We've discussed this at length in other presentations, and it's vital to give you accurate assessment techniques because we know from research that the dog's muscle tone is impacted massively by its emotions. And if you don't use clinic enrichment and therapeutic handling, the dog's going to reflect its emotions within that um, environment rather than attaining its natural balanced posture for you to get some really accurate information from. You need to be really mindful of the location of your superficial muscles. So as I said, if you peel back the coat and the skin and the superficial, superficial um, fascia, you're literally on latissimus dorsi there. And another top clinical tip that I think is so useful is when, you, when you're doing any soft tissue work, any manual therapy work, any massage therapies, any myofascial releases, you have to know the fiber direction of each muscle that you're impacting on. And I find a really useful way for me is to lay my fingers. So I will literally lay my fingers and my middle finger will lay on the longitudinal fiber direction. And I use that as a memory jog rather than learning in-depth script, which will say, if I can get this right, caudal dorsal to cranial ventral. And I find that really confusing. So I like to use my hands on the muscles because once you know the muscle fiber direction, you can then apply appropriate techniques to the dog's tissue longitudinally or transversely, and you'll have such an amazing effect on that tissue. The other thing with therapeutic handling is that it really builds that professional bond of trust and confidence. So the dog's emotions are balanced with you and you will get a very clear reading of the muscle tissue. And you're going to be really responsive to the dog's feedback signals in real time in your clinic setting because they tell you so much from their body posturing and facial expressions, which are very subtle. So just having a little look at this, just want to um, check I haven't missed anything that's really important. So it was just to identify this is the acromial head of deltoid. This is the scapular head of deltoid. And this is just under the skin and the superficial fascia is what you palpate and it's a shoulder flexor. There's the trapezius thoracic part laying um, superficial to that part of latissimus dorsi. So be mindful when you're palpating where you're actually palpating and you're not moving on to trapezius, the thoracic part, or moving into the limb and palpating deltoid or the long head of triceps here. I'm just watching the clock because I've got to stick to my time. Muscle facts, what does it do? Okay, so we know um, it's a retractor of the forelimb and we know it's the dog's swimming muscle and digging muscle, but there's a bit more to that story. It decelerates the forelimb cranial motion. So the swing phase when the dog isn't weight bearing or loading, the swing phase forward is called protraction. And so what it does is it decelerates that fore, forelimb cranial motion. We also know it draws the trunk cranially. So if the paw is fixed, it's going to draw the trunk cranially over that paw. We also know that it extends the vertebral column along with the epaxials. So the epaxials are your key stabilizing muscles in the dog. Obviously in the horse, it's different. And that is why Comparative anatomy is really important to give you a more depth, but stick to your canine anatomy. It's really important you look at quadruped anatomy because comparing human to dog will mislead you. So it, through its attachment, it is a caudal core stabilizer. Hopefully somebody else can hear me. If someone can just let me know if it's just Alan who's lost the sound. Thank you, Michelle. That's great. Thank you, June. That's brilliant. So through its attachments, because it's this amazing mobile structure, 
it can have actions where it is a caudal core stabilizer along with the epaxials. And when you apply specific techniques like static or dynamic alignment treatment techniques, we can dominate where we're going to action that muscle. So it extends the vertebral column along with the epaxials. It draws the limb against the trunk. And you may have had this where you've got a dog with a hind limb issue. And what they do is they place their paws of the dog, they bring them cordially, and they place them right against the trunk. And they're kind of locked there. And that's the Tismus dorsi working. Okay, so this is a great thing to start considering when you want to replace and use proprioceptive paw placement, how you're going to replace the forelimb paws into an appropriate place to get that natural balance stance engaged. When the limb is free, it draws, its it draws it cordially during shoulder flexion. So as deltoids working in teres major, and there's another little muscle called teres minor, there your shoulder flexors, as you've got shoulder flexion, when it's in the swing phase and it's, it's drawing a free limb backwards, so cordially, latissimus dorsi is doing that. However, we know that the retraction phase, the sweep phase with contact against the ground is the power sweep. So the powering is all about the hind paws because the main power muscles in the dog are hamstrings and gluteals, whereas the forelimbs predominantly are about shock absorbing and um, a braking system. So we've got to really consider latissimus dorsi's function free as protraction and also in the retraction phase. And what we know from research definitely um, is that it doesn't work in steady state um, activities. So in steady state walk and in steady state trotting, it's hardly activating because the EMG studies show we have a burst of activity in that muscle when it's um, just at the end of the swing phase, which would make sense because it's breaking brachycephalic as your protractor to bring it back. It also has um, halfway with swing phase to placing the paw, a big burst of energy then, so activation then. But that's in the swing phase when it's not being supported and it's not giving you power. So you can't strengthen this muscle by using those parts of the movement. What we can do is understand that when you do incline work, when you're doing swimming actions, when you're doing digging actions against some force, the Sismus dorsi works really far past midway in stance phase. So understanding how the muscle works in different parts of um, motion is going to really help you be able to adapt and use an appropriate treatment technique from your therapeutic treatment toolbox. So here, this is just to show you how high the ventral border of latissimus dorsi is. I hope you can see that. It's just a, a yellow pipe cleaner. We haven't drawn on that lovely dog. We wouldn't do that. And this is just to show you one of the many alignment techniques. Now, alignment techniques can be static. They can be dynamic. Static and dynamic ones can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. And if you want to know more about these astonishing treatment techniques that you can do on land, and you can do in water. Um, the level four diploma in um, advanced canine hydrotherapy treatment techniques, and we've got this coming out now. We're the first providers in the UK ready to deliver it. So it's rather than thinking of it as a total course, it's a modular course where you can do unit by unit. And there's an amazing advanced treatment technique unit in the pool. And there's an amazing advanced treatment technique in the underwater treadmill. They're 15 credits each, and you could do those as a separate CPD package. And this is where we're going to share all the alignment techniques that we are using and how you link those to proprioceptive pore placements. And we can do that on land and in the water. So if we think that the dog is designed to go forward in the sagittal plane, and we think that we're optimizing it, have a think where this technique when we've got equal pressure from our forelimb and our fingers is lying. It's lying on latissimus dorsi. We're giving the latissimus, latissimus dorsi some information. Now, how can we activate it motor-wise? Easy. We're going to use therapeutic handling and movement shaping techniques. And this is really functional for the dog, so the impact on it is dramatic. Again here, just showing you this alignment technique, it's equal pressure. Now, if you've not been taught these by your training provider, please don't try these at home. 
It's like if you've only been taught how to use a flotation jacket in the water, please don't try and do natural balance motion using a Y-shaped harness. Go back to your training provider and, and get that instruction. It's like watching people drive cars. You don't think you can just get in a car and do it. So stay in your scope of practice, but these alignment techniques, we're going to have instructional videos um, within our bespoke course resource that you can use as well as masterclasses to practice them because they have the most dramatic effect because we're impacting latissimus dorsi. And so if you think about it, when you move with the dog in balance, in natural balance, in a Y-shaped harness, in the pool or in the treadmill, you are engaging latissimus dorsi and you are doing a caudal core dynamic stability treatment technique that you cannot match on land. So we may have some sound issues here. We do have storms. We are having a bit of a problem. So I'm going to go to ask a question. If you're voting on them, if you could please stop voting so I can answer them. Running over a little bit. I'm trying very hard to stick to time. So the first one. Michelle, you've asked me, trigger points that spasm found lateral to the lower last seven or eight thoracic spine without a global picture, which of course there would be. Is there a way to decide through palpatory skills, whether it's latissimus dorsi or other epaxial muscles? So the epaxial muscles are deep and they're covered by the deep fascia and latissimus dorsi lays on top of them. And then on top of latissimus dorsi, where you're, where you're suggesting is the trapezius muscle, and it's going to be the thoracic part of the trapezius muscle that you're finding the trigger points. It's impossible to deeply play, um, locate trigger points in deep muscles. So you're going to be feeling trigger points in your superficial muscles or in your fascial gutterings around muscles. So a very common site is between the long head and lateral head, so go back to that um, bite size anatomy and see where that is. The fascial guttering is like the valley between those two muscles, a very common site. Another common site is between your middle gluteal muscle and your superficial gluteal muscle, where there's kind of like a valley in the muscle and that's a gutter of fascia. Um, so where you're suggesting is a very common site in the thoracic part of the trapezius muscle. I hope that um, answers your question, Michelle. So the next one is from Mel Matthews. And the question is, hope you don't mind me going back to your last crowdcast. Never, because if you have followed tonight and seen the other ones, we realize all these muscles are integrated, all their actions are integrated so intimately, you cannot just locate one muscle, muscle and action it. You are going to impact the surrounding muscles, particularly if you, they share attachments and fascial sheaths. So, um, looking at the attachments of quads, which we know quadriceps is really deep in the dog, whereas in the human it's very superficial, just under the skin. Getting dogs to walk backwards, which we see a lot of. I absolutely would never, ever walk a dog backwards. If you want to know why, look at the um, natural balanced canine motion crowdcast, because dogs are designed to go forwards. And I know there's a lot of activity of people walking puppies backwards and dogs backwards. And I'm completely against it because it compromises the biomechanical design. We know from research that to work outside of a biomechanical design, you are pushing towards fatigue or um, impacting some kind of destruction into that design. We know that there is a huge extra force in backward motion with the dog if you're going to walk it backwards. I'm not talking about maneuvering a step back. That's fine because it's a maneuver dogs can use. But dogs don't come running backwards to you. You're putting a huge force through the caudal cruciate ligament and through the lumbar sacral junction, an un unnecessary force. So if you want to do proprioceptive enriched activities, particularly in the athletic dog, the last thing you want to do is walk them backwards because you will slow the flight and speed of their contact forwards. So we don't want vertical height. We want a forward thrust. So using a technique from a canine therapist point of view, I'm not talking from a training point of view. I'm talking from a canine therapist point of view where I want to optimize canine natural balance motion and optimize the well-being of the dog's movement and function is always going to be in a forward direction using these alignment techniques, proprioceptive pore placement, therapeutic handling, um, and, and a whole range of other trick techniques that are functional, relevant to the dog, four paws are on the ground, 
and the dog you know will progress so much more rapidly as well i hope that answers your question mel we can talk more if you want to pm me the next question from alan gardner hello alan good evening not strictly related to the topics today so it's a bit hard let's see what it is um I'm not sure what you mean by the CCFT course. I can't really qu quote on that. Rhomboids and trapezius are first to fatigue and intense exercise. That's untrue. Um, don't know where you've got that research from. Research supporting, that's not the case. Usually your superficial muscles will fatigue first rather than your deep, they're your stabilizers, unless you haven't done appropriate conditioning. So in agility dogs, I do a lot of work in this area. Just wondered if you would agree with this theory. Th Exactly. I think what happens with social media, there's a lot of very strong opinions and quotes. Let's base our discussion and let's base our therapeutic treatment techniques on facts. And these are the facts about latissimus dorsi. Um, and I think kind of stick to that. But Alan, if you want to PM me and have a bit more information, I'm really happy with that. And we've got another one on triceps from Mel Matthews. Last question, because I'm running out of time. Um, I feel a lot of tightness in triceps and can't dissociate with lats and now it makes sense what I'm and now it makes sense with what I'm feeling. So latissimus dorsi, you've got to really understand the location of it and and actually we we have got this arrangement where latissimus dorsi comes in and actually fuses onto the aponeurosis that lays medial on triceps. So we are going to impact both muscles, definitely. And then with the deep petrals, which it gives a, a muscle fiber bundle to deep pecs and latissimus dorsi go into the medial brachial fascia so of course we're going to affect it um, and i think going back to the triceps really understanding how to palpate your lateral head and your long head will really help with that mel great question okay so if you liked it please give me some feedback um, if i haven't got round to your questions i can carry questions over from these three um, in the series on to the next one um, we are going to look at biceps brachii next time and Harriet asked to cover that and it kind of falls in with what we're discussing because we know that the muscle bundle and the fascia goes over biceps brachii. Biceps brachii in the human is just under your skin, it's two heads, we know how to action it in the human, but it's so different, it's so different in the dog. And this is where it's really important that you look at canine anatomy please don't go and look at plantar grade quadrupeds like badgers or bears because their muscle structure is designed architecturally to meet their de their design which is to do activities dogs definitely do not do um, if you're going to compare a human to a dog remember humans are plantar grade our heels are on the ground dogs natural balance poor balance they're digigrade go onto the balls of your feet that's a, dog, a dog's natural pore balance. So again, don't go across species, stick to your species and really develop that deep knowledge because that gives you the answers for your treatment techniques that you choose. And I feel it's really important to work with the dog. We've got research showing that you cannot separate canine behavior to muscle tone and having that functional anatomy and working with the dog, you will get the best results. Um, and it's just an amazing experience having so many people wanting to know more about anatomy and I can't wait to deliver biceps break eye and tell you all about it Thanks so much and hopefully um, you heard me. I'm sorry about the interruptions It's been a stormy night and everybody in the UK. Please keep safe and in Ireland keep safe <laughs>